Hi guys. It is a stormy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. And, uh, here on this gloomy, where are we? Wednesday, February 4th, 2020, somewhere in there. And you have stumbled into Collapse Chronicles. I am Sam Mitchell. This is my little co-host, Sancho Panza. And we're going to do what we do every day <coughs> to start our day. Uh, we're going to chronicle the collapse of a planet. But before I get into today's chronicle, a <coughs> couple of big thank yous to send out. First to my old buddy Luddite for Life. I really, really appreciate your latest contribution to the calls to support my work here on YouTube and also a huge thank you to constituent of clowns <laughs> a constituent of clowns I like the name uh, Kevin uh, anyway thank you brother once again for your continued support of my work and for anybody out there who has ever found it in their hearts and wallets to support what I do, whatever that is on YouTube, I really do appreciate it. And I also want to thank all of you folks for sending in all of these ideas for the daily collapse. And we're going to send a big thank you out to alert <coughs> listener Graydon. Graydon has finally... It has finally happened. We, we have some intelligent reporting on the coronavirus. Uh, I try to avoid talking about the biggest distraction possibly of, uh, of the millennium, uh, certainly of the 2020s, uh, the coronavirus. But <coughs> Anyway, as much as I've tried to avoid it, and I've done a pretty good job, I guess here in Austin, Texas, it sounds like the coronavirus has shut down the South by Southwest Music Festival. Not the coronavirus, the corona fever. I call corona fever the fear about the coronavirus. They are two completely separate things. They have almost nothing to do with each other at this point. There is the coronavirus, which is about this big, and there is the corona fever, which is getting this big and this big and this big. So anyway, uh, I'm going to say this is an article about corona fever and I am absolutely shocked to see this is coming from ABC News. Oh, I think it's the Australian. No, it's not the American. Uh, I believe this is the ABC from Australia, not from the U.S. So that explains it a little bit different. Okay, and this is by a fellow named... Jeff Dawson. We have to get Jeff on the show. He sounds like a good guy. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and what is on Jeff's mind today during Corona fever outbreak in Australia? The human race is not special, so why do we think we are immune to mass extinctions? Could we face a mass extinction of human beings in our lifetime? As global temperatures rise and this summer's bushfires devastate the Australian landscape, it is a worst case scenario that is beginning to be seriously discussed. The rapid spread of the coronavirus in recent weeks has also escalated the anxiety that people feel about their mortality. However, 
there seems to be, there seems to be a difference in the way the public has reacted to these two threats. Global warming and potential mass extinction, meaning not only of humans, but of every other uh, earthling we share the planet with. Okay, so we have coronavirus on this side of the ledger, and on this side of the ledger we have the looming extinction of every earthling on the planet, including humans. So these are the two things that uh, we have to compare. Global warming and potential mass extinctions are seen as a vague threat somewhere out there. Somewhere out there in the future. Hmm, out there in the distant future. Whereas coronavirus is viewed as a clear and imminent danger. The growing fear, meaning the corona fever, the growing fear, the growing fear of a coronavirus pandemic appears to have quickly motivated Australian health authorities and governments into immediate and, according to this guy, appropriate action. By comparison, the anxiety around global warming and potential mass extinction seems muted. Seems muted. No, it seems absent. Okay. Human beings have a naive optimism, a naive optimism. A report written by Paul Gilding, uh, got to get, Paul agreed to be interviewed on Collapse Chronicles, then when I tried to uh, pin the man down, he just kept kicking the can down the road. I have to get back with Paul and see whatever happened to him. I finally just gave up. Uh, <clears throat> a report written by Paul Gilding, a fellow at the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and commissioned by the Breakthrough National Center for Climate Restoration, put forward the view that there is a, quote, high likelihood of human civilization coming to an end in 2050 if action is not taken to curb climate change. Climate change deniers will typically denounce any discussion of mass extinction as histrionic doomsday talk. While some climate change believers argue that discussing mass extinction now is precipitous and dampens the optimism that we can turn global warming around with a positive can-do spirit. <clears throat> Who would have thought that both these camps have a psychological mindset in common, a naive optimism that human beings are just so clever that it will all turn out okay. So what he is, of course, describing here are the apocaloptimists. The apocaloptimists, people who understand uh, how the, the, the situation that we're in, and yet, uh, although they, they intellectualize that on one level, they say, we're going to figure this out. The hopium-soaked apocaloptimist, which is quickly making me feel sicker than the outright deniers. <clears throat> Psychoanalysts use the term Manic defense, manic <coughs> defense, to describe how human beings can pathologically cling to optimism <coughs> and hope as a way of denying their depression and anxiety. To contemplate mass extinction 
is indeed a dark place to go and a difficult conversation to have. Even more difficult than global warming itself because it is to think the unthinkable. But spiritual traditions across the world believe it brings depth and richness to our lives to contemplate our own death. <clears throat> it does not necessarily have to be a morbid preoccupation. It is sobering to consider what scientists tell us of the paleoontological history of the earth, which may throw some light on the fate of human beings when we look at the broad sweep of time. This is National Geographic science writer Michael Greshko, quote, more than 99% of all organisms that have ever lived on Earth are extinct as new species evolve to fit ever-changing ecological niches, older species fade away at least a handful of times in the last 500 million years, 75 to more than 90 percent of all species on Earth have disappeared in a geological blink of an eye in catastrophes we call mass extinctions. Close quote. And then back to Jeff. We are not special. As human beings, we need to remind ourselves that we are oxygen breathing biped mammals. <clears throat> In other words, we are animals. Evolutionary science demonstrates that we are continuous, not discontinuous with other animal species. If one's view of the world is based on science, we are not special. We are not placed here by a god to be the custodians of the earth. Nobody, nobody, would you please weigh in on that comment. We are not placed here by God to be the custodians of the earth, <clears throat> and if we were, we have let the Almighty down big time, <clears throat> and like all other species, we will have our place in the sun. <clears throat> we will die out, and other more adaptable life forms will take our place. Yeah, like jellyfish, for instance. I think jellyfish uh, might be adaptable enough to the, uh, the wreckage we are leaving in our wake. <clears throat> Maybe cockroaches. Uh, the myth that we, meaning humans, the myth that we are somehow special and will continue to live forever as a dominant species is based on a deluded human-centric form of existential narcissism. We may wring our hands and our hearts may ache at the rapid destruction of wildlife that is happening right now before our eyes but we never seem to seriously consider that we may go the same way. But, as the poet John Donne wrote, quote, Do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And don't forget, death can be transformative. Yes, death can be transformative. Uh, you can't argue with that. We may liken the state of the earth to a man who has just been told by his doctors that he has lung cancer. <laughs> there is treatment available that might save him, but it, can, but it cannot be guaranteed that it will work. The human species may metaphorically keep puffing away on fossil fuels and inevitable death may well be 
the outcome in a blip of geological time. But even if we undergo the treatment, otherwise known as changing over to sustainable forms of renewable energy, for example, there is no guarantee of our survival. I love this. This guy talks about naive optimism and then he suggests that changing over to sustainable forms of renewable energy has a chance to, uh, <laughs> to you know, to, to save ourselves and the planet. I, I, I love we all have our blind spots. Uh, uh, if I ever get Jeff on the show, I'm going to point out this blind spot and see what he says, although he clearly understands that changing over to renewable energy is no guarantee of our survival. Yes. Friends of mine who work professionally in palliative care tell me that most people have peaceful deaths. Even better, it is well documented that some people have transformative spiritual experiences as they near the inevitability of death. They atone for all their past mistakes quite freely, I bet, and without restraint. Their hearts open to loved ones and enemies alike, and they experience a sense of oneness with the transience of life and the interconnectedness of all things. We can only aspire to the same maturity of spirit. So let's talk about this candidly. As a psychologist, uh, so this fellow is a psychologist, as a psychologist, years of clinical experience tells me it is healthier to gently bring anxiety out into the open and discuss it empathically with others rather than taking refuge in angry denial or manic defense. This includes how we talk to children about this distressing topic when they want to engage us with their questions and their fears. Yes, I guess you talk to them by telling them to start digging a bunker. The same guidelines for talking to children generally about death can be applied here. When I have worked with children who have a parent with a life-threatening illness, I find it is much wiser for the adults to tell the truth calmly and kindly rather than give false hope. There is a vast difference in saying to a child, Daddy is very sick, but the doctors are going to make him better and he will be home soon, compared to Daddy is very sick and everyone is doing everything they can to help him get better, but we cannot be sure he is going to live much longer. We all hope he pulls through. Huh. He just said he advises against giving false hope, and then he says to tell a child, we all hope he pulls through. Children can sniff out the anxious emotions behind the sweet syrupy words of false optimism much more than we give them credit for. They pick up an incongruence between the positive messages and the exaggerated emotion with which, is, which it is expressed and it confuses them. Being straight with them will calm them far more than false optimism. Yes, I, I can only imagine uh, talking to an eight-year-old who says, Daddy, why was I ever born? Why did you send me into a burning lake of fire? Anyway, <clears throat> getting back to Jeff's uh, fine essay. 
when we embrace the end, our lives are more vibrant. This means the adults learning to calm themselves in the face of their own inevitable mortality. The practice of mindfulness and the contemplation of one's own death is one beneficial way to do this. <clears throat> While mass extinction from global warming, including mass extinction of human beings, is a new and concerning threat that we have not ever had to face before. Death itself is not new. <clears throat> Our here and now lives are more vibrant and full of gratitude when we can embrace them fully. So Jeff Dawson is a psychologist and Zen Buddhist teacher. And, uh, you know, all joking aside, what Jeff is touching on here, guys, is, uh, you, you know, after being down in this rabbit hole myself, good Lord, for 12 years now, it's been 12 years I've been down here in the Doomosphere, you, you get to be a little Zen-like Buddhist yourself. Uh, that when when you completely eradicate all hope, all hope is false hope. They, they always what is this false hope? That's uh, that's a contra is that a contradiction in terms or or a redundancy? I have to roll that one around in my brain. When you abandon all hope. Okay, and understand on a cellular level that nothing is going to turn this freight train around. That uh, the, this planet and humanity, this civilization, everything else is going straight down the toilet. There's nothing you're going to do about it. Uh, the only, the only uh, conclusion is to get out there and enjoy your life the best you can while you still can. Uh, this, this is the only advice. Uh, the only question from here on out is once I've embraced this knowledge of how screwed we are, how do I comport myself? How do I live? Uh, the rest of my vibrant life while I still can because this whole thing uh, can, th 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 this whole shit show is coming down and we all know it and one recommendation is to laugh off the coronavirus. Uh, unbelievable. The, uh, the, the corona fever going on, uh, as they say, just shutting down, I'm pretty sure, South by Southwest Music Festival. Has it shut down the Olympics? Uh, anyway, you have better things to do with your life, guys, than freaking out about corona fever, okay? Uh, let me tell you uh, where corona virus uh, places in your life. It is corona fever that is going to cause you a lot more uh, headaches and heartaches than the coronavirus. And you can take that from this chronicler of the collapse to the bank. So anyway, uh, if you did enjoy what Jeff had to say about humans not being special, Please take a few seconds to thumb up this video, and if you did not like what Jeff had to say, uh, take a few seconds to thumb it down. If you believe that uh, that that God uh, made us special, for instance, maybe you want to thumb it down. Uh, and while you're over here, by all means, please uh, take a moment to subscribe to Collapse Chronicles for more doom and gloom. And now I need to uh, prepare for my interview.
coming up here in a few hours with economist John Quiggins, where we're going to, John and I are going to certainly be talking about corona fever, not coronavirus, corona fever and its effects on the global industrial economy. And I should have that interview out this weekend, but get out there and enjoy it while you still can, guys. Let the death of a planet be your advisor on how to live the rest of your life while you still can. Because it is Girl Scout cookie time and enjoy every Girl Scout cookie little palm oil bomb while you still can because Girl Scout cookies are getting ready to say bye bye along with the Girl Scouts. Bye guys. <laughs>